management and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I was here yesterday. It was one of the first speakers, and I'm now one of the last, so it's a full circle. It's nice. I wanted to share a bit of my. Well, first of all, these are all personal comments. Uh, they don't reflect the views of my employer. But I wanted to share a bit of my views and what I've learned in my experience uh, by advising startups. Uh, and also looking at them from a policy perspective and uh, participating on many startup competitions and uh, I wanted to share a bit of what I see out there. Uh, it, it will be brief, but uh, I hope it's of interest. I think that uh, startup is a word that you uh, hear pretty often, but uh, I don't know exactly what that means. I wanted to kind of try to explain it because this is something that I have to do quite often. A, start, a startup is not a smaller version of a company. It's not about size. It's uh, in the same way that it's not a large companies are not a larger version of startups. I think that it mainly has to do with the way they approach innovation. Uh, a startup is constantly innovating, and they have to figure out things as they go along. Uh, a company already has established business plan, so even though they still have to continue innovating, uh, much of their regular day-to-day -day, uh, activities is going through the already established uh, parameters. So that's why a startup is a temporary organization that is constantly looking for a scalable and repeatable business model. Uh, the only problem with that is that innovation is chaotic, it's messy, and it's uncertain. Uh, not everyone has a stomach for it. Uh, I, some people do thrive in this environment, but it's not for everyone. Uh, I would also like to mention that my experience is more based on uh, internet uh, startup companies, uh, and I think that that varies a bit from industry to industry. Uh, but in industry, in the industry of uh, internet, it's usually the startups they feel that they do not need uh, legal advice. That's the main problem that I I see whenever an entrepreneur talks to me. They they think that they will figure out that later, at a later stage. Sometimes this can be helpful, uh, and it can be helpful in the way that sometimes if they do not approach the right lawyer, the lawyer who they approach, which is usually the friend of a friend who is doing some law, but maybe not uh, this type of law, they usually provide advice that it's not suited to the company. They provide advice that maybe they would, it scales down some of the efforts or, or ideas of the entrepreneur, and that might be the end of the startup. It might not uh, go beyond that. Um, so, I guess that I wa what I'm trying to say is that we should not apply since startups are, constant, are dynamic and constantly changing, we cannot apply anything traditional to them. And that goes for legal advice. Uh, there's no blanket legal advice that applies to any startup. And specifically talking about uh, IP, someone who wants to provide IP advice, I, I think you touched upon this, you have to start with a, from scratch. You cannot say, uh, well, you have a patent, you, would, you need to do this. You have a trademark, you need to register the trademark. It depends, and it depends on every situation. And it has business implications as well. So I guess regarding the question, is IP, will it become costly? Uh, not necessarily. It depends on how you approach it. Um, 
Most successful startups they are based on an idea, disrupting traditional industries. And uh, this is something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, a startup should think about disruption in the whole in the whole way that the startup, uh, the life of a startup. Uh, I think that the best uh, description of this is a startup should be treated as an asymmetrical warrior. They they have uh, all companies have limited resources, but startups have even more limited resources. So they have to devise strategies within those limited resources and use them to the best of their abilities to deliver results. Uh, and this doesn't always mean uh, following traditional advice. For example, uh, Tesla, the makers of a lot of technologies dealing with batteries and renewable energy and cars, uh, they, instead of going through the traditional approach of getting patents, which they did, and maybe that was the strategy at the beginning, afterwards they decided to go to an open source uh, model. And this is something that maybe some thought it was crazy, but it made sense for, for Tesla. Uh, they just wanted to, of course, maybe at the beginning they did need the patents maybe to grow the business and to get investment and to secure their, their piece in the business, but then they view it as it was not necessary to their business model. This is what I mean that you have to follow a different approach to different startup. And this is, maybe Tesla is, not, is no longer a startup, it's an established company. At one time it had a, one of the largest, it overtook the market capitalization of traditional automakers. But my point is that they still behave as if they were a startup. This is for Tesla, but it can also apply to smaller companies. For example, uh, BrewDog, which actually they have a, a, a shop near the train station here. Uh, they did something similar. They went to the open source uh, model and they published all of their recipes for their beers, the ones that they have produced and the ones that they have not produced, the ones that they were experimenting <laughs> with. And instead of protecting them through traditional models, I would think that maybe the best approach would have been to protect them through trade secret or any other model, but they decided to publish them. And this, first of all, gave them a lot of good publicity. And on the other hand, it also made their brand stronger. So it's, when you look at a, a strategy, you have to look at it from different perspectives. So I guess that uh, the point of what I wanted to say is that you have to balance priorities. Of course, if you had unlimited resources, you could do everything. You could tackle all of the problems that you wanted. You would have all the money to file all the patents that you want, or get all the trademarks, or fight all of the domain name uh, disputes that you want, but that's not the case. You have to look at it from the unique vantage point of the entrepreneur. And I think earlier today someone was saying that the lawyers have taken control over the IP when it's, it has business implications, but you have to look at it from both perspectives. You cannot negate the legal approach, but you also cannot negate the business approach. So I guess that the legal advice, this is something that I tell all the entrepreneurs that want, are seeking advice, you have to provide legal advice that it's not limiting but legal advice that gives opportunities and opens possibilities. Uh, I don't know if this is good for lawyers. Uh, I guess this uh, might sound that it's, you're limiting the role of the lawyers, but I don't think that's the case. You just need lawyers that are more specialized and lawyers that also understand business and I think that 
going forward, lawyers have to look at uh, things from a more holistic approach. They have to think creatively and business-wise. And this is not something that comes from day and night. Like for a lawyer to provide this kind of advice, they have to be an expert and they have to know the system inside and out. And once they know it, they can provide advice on what specifically works for your situation in particular. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's what I wanted to share. Uh,